Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and start. Um, getting a lot of good questions in the chat, so I'll try to answer those as we go. I know a lot of these questions are um, going to be answered during the presentation, but if they're not, I'll, I'll go back and look and, and make sure we answer everything. Uh, Dr. Stephen Green is already answering a few questions. I appreciate that. He's an organic lychee grower, so you can trust his information. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And um, thank you guys for coming. And we will be recording this and you're gonna be on mute during the webinar. So if you wanna ask questions, just put them into the chat. Okay. Oh, so my name is Jeff Wasileski. I'm the commercial tropical fruit crops agent for uh, University of Florida and Miami-Dade County. And today we're gonna to talk about successfully growing the lychee in South Florida. And welcome to Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. We do this once a month. Um, today we're gonna to talk about lychees and next month we're gonna talk about grafting tropical fruit. Uh, last month we did uh, air layering tropical fruit. And in April, we're gonna talk about tropical fruit CSI. So we're gonna be looking at problems and try to figure out what caused them. So I mentioned that I work for University of Florida and Miami-Dade County. UF IFAS Extension has an, has an office in every single county in Florida. So all 67 counties, we have an office. Depending on what is in that county, we have um, extension agents that work with the people in that county. So further up the state, you'll have extension agents that work with um, people that grow cattle. And down here, we have me, we have someone who works with tropical fruit because we have a great deal of tropical fruit growers growing them commercially here. And I work with commercial growers primarily. Uh, we also have some research education centers throughout the state that are part of the University of Florida. And we have one just down the street from my office called the Tropical Research Education Center, TREC. And I'm very lucky there uh, because I have a tropical fruit specialist, Dr. Crane, that I work with. I have a trop tropical fruit entomologist, Dr. Carrillo. I have a tropical fruit plant breeder, Dr. Chambers. Uh, we have a plant pathologist, Dr. Gaziz. I work with all these uh, great people. And my job is to take the information, the research that they have, and extend it to the growers. So that's where the word extension comes from. Okay, so I always like to start out with where you can get good information. Um, I always point you towards something called EDIS, E-D-I-S. So if you were to search the words E-D-I-S space U-F space lychee, you would get this document, lychee growing in the Florida home landscape. Uh, I think it's about eight to 10 pages. It has everything you ever want to know about growing uh, lychee and it's very good information. And EDIS is the University of Florida database. And you can't get things into EDIS unless they're peer reviewed. So I can't just write something and put it there. I can write something and put it on our website, but, um, and it can get checked for grammar and things like that. But to get a real good peer review, it has to go to EDIS. Uh, and EDIS, um, they really look at it carefully. So you know the information there is good because many people, many experts look at it. So a lot of good information there. Uh, another good place to get information is other universities. So if University of Florida doesn't have it, I always give the example of breadfruit. We don't have a lot of information on breadfruit. Some people are trying to grow breadfruit here. So you could search breadfruit uh, space edu and that would get you to another university, probably University of Hawaii, which would have some good information on uh, breadfruit. So you can usually trust other uh, universities. Very good information. Okay, uh, YouTube. YouTube, of course, you can get plenty of bad information there, but there's a lot of good information. Uh, you're gonna, the thing I really like about it is you can actually see what they're, what they're teaching you. And if you watch three, five, 
you know, or so videos on the same subject, you kind of get the overall idea. And I have TFT there because all the Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, except for today, are on uh, YouTube. So if you were to go to YouTube and use their search bar and just put in Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, you'll find all the other ones. We have one on avocado, mango. Um, we have one on um, mame. We have one on planting. We have one on pruning. Many different types of propagation. So lots of good information there uh, on Tropical Fruit Tuesdays YouTube section. Okay, another good place to get information is Master Gardeners. I know for a fact that we have some Master Gardeners um, that are watching today and listening. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for all the work you do. Um, probably the best place for you to get information is your own garden or your own grove. If you see it with your own eyes, you know it's true. And you should be out there scouting. You should be out there looking. This is how you find problems. This is how you figure out what went wrong by, by scouting and looking into your grove. We're gonna to talk today about the lychee aranose mite. And one thing you really need to do with that is scouting to be looking for it. Um, and then finally, beware the source, beware of where you get your information because obviously not everything uh, is gonna be great information. And not everything is true that you read. Okay, so we're talking about lychee, lychee chinensis, and I call it lychee, some people call it lychee, both are correct, so don't worry about that. I'm sorry if you've heard lychee all your life and now I'm saying lychee and it's really messing with you, I do apologize. Okay, so it's in the Sapindaceae, so other fruit that are in that family that are related are longan, that's one we have here, the trees look very similar, but the fruit are very different. Uh, rambutan, that's ultra tropical, and so is uh, pulsan, so we can't grow those here. Uh, we also have um, aki, that's in the family. Uh, we, and aki is, is loved by uh, Jamaicans, and we did have a Jamaican question here from Anna. I've heard that lychees are popular in Jamaica. Is it okay to bring them with me if I travel to Jamaica? Uh, you're going to have to declare them, so make sure you do that. Okay, so the, um, the, the flowers are either male, female, or sort of this combination male called an M2. This is what they'll look like. And depending on how much cold we get, you can get all males or you can get males and females. Obviously, you need the females uh, to get the fruit. So here's pictures. On the left, you see some males that you can see there. Um, and then on the right, you have uh, females. So if you look at the panicle really well, you can see, sorry about that, you can see if they're male or female. And what you're looking for is lots of females because that's where you're gonna get your fruit. It looks like there's a bee right in there doing what they do best. Okay, so here's a close up of the male female. Okay, and here's some young fruit that are setting before they turn color. Okay, so we had some questions about uh, where or when you can buy fruit. So the season in, in South Florida is May to June. And there are two main cultivars. Mauritius and Brewster. We did have another question, what's the best one that will um, give you fruit? And it's definitely Mauritius. I'm gonna show you a whole list of different um, lychees that are grown, that can be grown in, in South Florida, but really Mauritius is the, the one that if you're gonna get fruit, you're gonna probably get it from Mauritius. And it is difficult to get fruit from lychee. This is not in the easiest uh, tree to get fruit from. And we'll talk about the cold that it needs in order to set fruit uh, and to, to bloom. Okay, and the percent of fruit set varies from zero to 50%. You're gonna get a lot of zeros if you have a lot of male flowers. And fruit maturity is determined by color, size, taste, and the bricks, which is a measurement of the sugars 
is the sweetness. Okay, so look at all these different cultivars here. And like I said, Mauritius is really, if you're gonna take a shot, Mauritius is the one that you're gonna wanna try to, to grow. And before we get into, I'm gonna show you pictures of a lot of these. Let me just look back at the questions and make sure I'm gonna answer all of them. Okay, let's see, let's see how many hours and what temperature is needed for lychees to bloom. We'll talk about that. Um, okay, another question on bloom. So we'll talk about that. Um, Ms. Wilcox asked what variety grows better here. So we answered that already. And David asks, I think he's asking where are lychee fruit native? So you have the name lychee chinensis, so that kind of gives you a clue. I'll leave that there for you. Okay. Uh, Robin asks if this will educate beginner gardeners. We'll give it a shot. Um, okay, so we're gonna move forward. And here's some of the, the different cultivars. So the top left there, you see Mauritius and Brewster. Mauritius is gonna be a little earlier. Brewster is gonna be a little later. And they are, um, those are your two commercial uh, cultivars. And really, like I said, Mauritius is gonna be the one that's gonna give you probably a better chance of having fruit. It's not definitely gonna give you fruit. Uh, let's see, Bengal, that's another one that's sometimes grown, Bosworth, early large red. Emperor is, is large. If you look at that quarter, it's a big fruit. So a lot of people will try to grow that commercially because they're going to get more money for it, but it has a, it doesn't really set fruit well. Uh, Hakip, Hanging Green, Kaimana, Kwame Pink. Uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden sold a lot of Kwame Pinks. Uh, about 20 years ago. So I don't know how many of those are still in the landscape. Kwame Red, No My Tongue, Ohia, Peerless. Seymour, Shang-Chi, Sweet Cliff, Yellow Red. So those are a lot of different cultivars that you just saw, also called varieties, but remember I'm steering you towards Mauritius if you're gonna give it a shot. Um, so if you're gonna propagate, if you know somebody that has a Mauritius tree, you could probably pretty easily propagate your own tree using air layering. This is a picture of an air layer on the right. And last month we talked about how to do air layers, so you could look that up on YouTube and watch the Tropical Fruit Tuesday on air layering. There's also an edis that I wrote on tropical fruit propagation um, that has information on, on air layering as well. So grafting not used as much with, with um, lychee propagation. We do grafting a lot for mangoes, avocados, sapodillas, carambolas, but lychee, Longan and guava are three that we're able to do air layering with. Uh, and air layering is just a type of propagation that's easier than grafting. Um, so top working, not that common. Top working is where you have a lychee tree, a big tree, and you sort of cut it down and then you graft into that. So if you don't know what that means, that's okay. Um, because we're not really getting into too much propagation today. Okay, now these are the requirements for optimum flowering and fruiting. So I kept telling you that lychees are not that easy to get them to fruit. And this is why. There's many reasons why. One of the main reasons why is they need certain amount of chill hours, just like a peach. So if they don't get enough chill hours, they won't bloom. So first of all, requirements for flowering and fruiting. One is no nitrogen or irrigation beginning about September. So as we're going into the dry season, you're gonna cut off the irrigation, you're gonna cut off fertilizer. 
because you don't want those trees to be active. You want them to be very just sort of sitting there waiting for the signal to bloom. And the signal will be this cold temperature. So you're not going to irrigate until you see those flowers. Then you start irrigating because that will help pump up the fruit. Okay, pruning. You're not going to prune those trees until after you harvest the fruit. Because if you prune them going into the dry season, that's going to get them to put out new leaves. It's going to force them to grow and that's going to throw off your, your blooming. Okay, so no nitrogen or irrigation going into the dry season. Irrigate only when flowers emerge and prune after harvest. So these are three things to remember. Okay, so here was the, the answer to the question of how much cold do they need? And I'm getting these numbers from a paper that was in the Florida State Hort Society Proceedings that was written by Dr. Jonathan Crane, who works over at the Tropical Research Education Center. So they just studied of how many hours, at what temperature, and how well, how well the trees fruited at those temperatures. And they did it with Mauritius, okay? So at or below 55 degrees, you need 180 hours of that temperature at or below 55 degrees. And that's, you know, starting September to, to let's say now. Um, at 60 degrees, you need 390 hours. So the lower it gets, the less hours you need. So that's a lot of hours. Now we have a system called FAWN. It's a U University of Florida weather data system. And you could go there and look up to see, um, but we have a question from Mana. What happens if we don't get a string of cold fronts and the hours aren't met? You're going to get a very spotty bloom and you're probably not going to get a lot of female flowers. So you're not going to get good, good fruiting. Uh, I've had a lot of questions um, that people have, are having trouble with their, their lychees not getting flowers and fruit. And it's usually it's the cold. We're not getting enough cold. This year, if you, if you paid attention, We've gotten a lot of cool weather. Okay. Um, so Dr. Green is saying there's now later slightly different information on chill hour requirements. So I'm going to unmute him in just a second and he's going to give us that information. But I want to show you that I did pull up data from the weather data system FAWN and you can look under temperature threshold report and from November to February 1st, we've had 181 hours below 55 and 393 below 60, at or below. So that hits these criteria, 180 and 390. And if you look at all the lychee around town, they all have uh, bloom. So let me see if I can unmute Dr. Green and we'll have another voice here. There you go, Dr. Green. All righty. Thank you, uh, Jeff. So the information on chill hours is true, but it was a study of correlation is that they found um, fruiting when there was a certain number of hours below certain temperatures. But in fact, that's just a rule of thumb. The mechanism is that there's a, there's a few critical days during that dormant period during which the temperature must be low enough. And we don't know which days those are. They're not predictable and they vary tree by tree and location by location. So by giving a broad overview, if it's cold enough, long enough, then the chances increase that your trees have it critically low at exactly the right time. The mechanism is that when the buds are dormant during the winter, they can then, when they, when they shoot out at the end of winter, uh, they can either become leaf up, um, shoots or flowering shoot panicles. And it depends on two hormones. One um, produces leaves and the other suppresses the leaf producing hormone and encourages the, uh, the, the flower and, and hence fruit producing hormone. And it's only when it's low enough at exactly the right time when those hormones are needed that, uh, that it determines whether the, the shoots become 
leaves or flowers. So that's a good rule of thumb. But in fact, there's probably only a one or two day period in the entire winter where it has to be low enough for your particular trees, depending on, the, on their stage, to, uh, uh, to experience the cold that will suppress the leaf producing hormone and thereby let the, uh, uh, the uh, flower producing hormone uh, uh, have effect. So it's not so much that the trees need that period of low temperature for long enough, it's rather that, that increases the chances that your trees will have the cold weather exactly when they need them. Thank you, Dr. Green. And go ahead and uh, mute yourself again if you could. A uh, few more questions and comments in the chat. Uh, Anna says, seems that there are implications for lychee as the climate continues to warm. Definitely. Um, going to be harder and harder to get them in South Florida, but that means that commercial groves can probably move a little further up the state. Uh, Celso asked, do the total hours have to be continuous or cumulative? So the answer is cumulative. Uh, Robin asked, are lychee self-pollinators? Uh, yeah, you can get fruit with just uh, one tree, but you're going to have better chance with more than one tree. And Brian asks, do some varieties require less chill hours than others? I would say, I don't know the answer to that, but I would say it's probably yes. And that's why you're getting Mauritius with better fruiting. Uh, and then remember what Dr. Green said, it also depends on what stage the, the flowers are at and the hormones, et cetera. Okay, so pollination. Um, I see Dr. Green is asking a, or answering about pollination there in the chat as well. Lychee flowers are predominantly pollinated by insects, mostly honeybees, and hives are sometimes placed in the groves during flower period. So these, these slides kind of talk about what I talked about before. Nitrogen fertilizer, you don't want to put that out as we're going into the dry season. That's basically what this is telling you here, because you don't want to wake these trees up. You want them calm, ready to get the, the signal to bloom. Okay, other nutrients, you're going to maintain at them at non-limiting levels. So this is not nitrogen. These are all your other nutrients that the plant needs. Uh, I've seen lychees just completely go downhill and they're not getting enough iron, they're not getting enough zinc, they're not getting enough potassium, they're not getting enough boron. So you have to make sure you're giving all these things to your trees. Um, you're gonna have non-limiting soil moisture from flowering through harvest. That's what I talk about when you start seeing those flowers, you start giving them the trees a little water, so you'll pump up the fruit. Um, you're gonna reduce or cease irrigation from September until signs of flowering. So that's what I talked about before. You want to calm the trees down. And you're going to do size control to maintain canopy light exposure and crop production. So you're pruning to get light into all sides of the tree. If you have a grove and you have a bunch of trees all next to each other, they're going to grow and they're going to, they're going to block each other out. So you have to keep them pruned. And um, I'll show you one way that that's done in groves. Okay, so water stress synchronizes the vegetative dormancy before exposure to low inductive temperatures during the winter. Can you tell Dr. Crane wrote this slide? Um, so that's just telling you, you need that drought stress to get them ready to go. Okay, so plant nutrition. We have moderate to poor, to poor soil fertility. So we don't have good nutrition in our soil. So leaf litter and mulching is beneficial. If you're gonna prune the trees, you can go ahead and take those leaves, chop them up and put them underneath uh, your tree. Um, base fertilizer applications are based, you're gonna base them on leaf analysis. And I'll show you a chart that goes with the leaf analysis. Uh, this is not that chart, this is a different chart. This is a chart that's showing you pH, excuse me. Uh, so don't get too confused by this chart, but look down at the bottom, that's pH, and seven is neutral. We're up here around eight. So as you see these fatter bars, these are things that will be available in that pH. 
So in the ground, in the soil, some of these thinner bars are not available. Iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc. So these you're gonna have to give to your tree, not through a granular fertilization that you put on the, the, the soil, but you're gonna spray them on the leaves as a foliar spray. So for these minor elements, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc, iron, you actually do a chelated drench of iron and you pour that on the roots. And that chelation allows the, the um, element to get to the roots and pass this bonding that happens with this high pH. So if here's your tree, your, your granular fertilizer is gonna go out here and it's what's called the drip line. So you're gonna put it out here like that and you don't want it in here right next to the trunk because that's where your bigger roots are. They're not picking up um, elements or fertilizer. That those roots that are, your feeder roots are out here on the drip line. Okay, so here's the chart that I told you about the nutrient levels. And I have this that I can give to you. So don't, don't try to you know, memorize it. But if you're gonna do a leaf analysis, of your lychee tree, you're gonna base it on these numbers. So these are kind of the numbers you wanna fall in between. And if you're lower, then you need more. If you're higher, you need less. So I have this, I have this for, for lychee, I think avocado, I think carambola, definitely mango. So if you need those, you can email me and I'll, I'll give those to you if you're gonna do leaf analysis for your nutrient levels. Okay, so I talked about pruning and why you wanna prune because you wanna get light to your, your trees. So here's a machine that is doing something called hedging where they cut the sides and you see it's at an angle. This top left is at an angle. So that way the top will get sun and the bottom will get sun because it angles in towards the tree. And then they're also going to cut the top, which is called um, topping. So you're hedging and topping. And hopefully this will work. We'll see exactly what it looks like. So this is a hedger, it's cutting the sides, this wild machine. And if it's not sharp enough, you it'll kind of tear the branches a little bit. So you don't want that, you want it nice and sharp. You see there's a tear sort of right there in the top right. So that's going and, and doing what's called hedging. I think they're not cutting off enough in this picture because you still have a lot of shade in there. I would have gone a little, little harder. Uh, okay, so one thing you're looking for once you start getting your flowers <clears throat> is lychee webworm. This is a, a little caterpillar that can do a lot of damage. So you want to keep an eye out for that if you see your um, flowers looking like this, that's lychee webworm. And up until now, that's been about the worst problem that lychee have had as far as insects and pests, until now. So now we have something called the lychee aranose mite and came from China. These pictures, are from Spain. This is from the original PowerPoint that talked about lychee where we just sort of talked about the lychee aranose mite as something far away that if it ever came here, it would be bad. So the bad news is it is here and it's bad. So general information about the lychee aranose mite, it's highly specific, it attacks lychee um, I have possibly long ends, but it doesn't attack long ends. I need to take that out of there. It attacks new leaf flushes, 
and they're the most susceptible. It also will get on the flowers and the young fruit. You see in this picture, that sort of white fuzz on there, that's the light geranos mite. Um, now you cannot see the mite with your naked eye. You can't see it with a, even with a microscope. You need a very powerful lens to, to see these. But it does feed on the cells and it creates this uh, rhina that looks like this. So I've been getting people sending me pictures of this and it's very clear that they have the light geranose mite. So it forms, it also forms these blisters. If you look at this leaf, um, these lip, the bottom left here, you see these blisters. That's another sign of the light geranose mite. And then it progresses to this hairy mass. So if you have this hairy mass, excuse me, you've had light geranose mite for a while. They feed on the fruit, flowers, and they're small enough to move by air currents and honeybees. So this is very, very scary stuff. Now, Florida is the leading producer of lychee in the country, and a high percentage of that production is found in Miami-Dade County. The history of the lychee mine in Florida, 1955, it was in Sarasota County. They wiped it out. 1993, it was in Coral Gables. They wiped it out, eradicated both times. February 2018, it was found in a three-acre commercial grove in Lee County. Right now, Lee County is on quarantine for their lychees. Um, and now it is in, I have eight counties here. I should update that. It's actually in uh, 13 counties. So here are areas where lychees are commercially grown. Everywhere you see a star, and that's about how many acres of, of lychees you have being grown commercially. Here is everywhere where we have lychee arenos mite, including Miami-Dade County. We just found it last year in Miami-Dade County. Um, so I have it in 13 counties, but I have 12 in parentheses because on the FDAX website, it lists 12 counties, but when you look at the map, it's 13 counties. So I think 13 is probably correct. So everywhere you see one of these little um, mites, that's, that's where we have fines at the moment. So all through here and then up here. So we can probably guess it's in St. Lucie and Indian River too, and probably in some of these other counties So what do you do if you have it? Well, first of all, contact me and contact FDAX. If you want to just contact me, um, that's, that's good because I'll contact FDAX and they'll come out and they'll look at it. They'll test it to make sure it is light geranose mite. And um, then they'll, they'll try to help you with some of these treatments. So one thing you want to do is prune off the areas with light geranose mite. Um, and this is if, if FDAX can't help you. If FDAX is probably going to contract to have these things done, so you don't need to do them uh, at, the, at this moment. But you do need to contact me and possibly FDAX if you want to. Um, but this is what they're probably going to do. They're going to prune the areas with light geranos mite, then they're going to burn or bury those plant debris. They're going to spray sulfur after the removal of the plant parts. And the sulfur is down here in the bottom. It's, um, that's the one that is, is labeled, has an emergency label. Um, then you're gonna spray sulfur at bud break and in a 15 day interview, interval, this may take up to 90 days and eight applications. So very difficult to, to take care of once you have it. So this is something that I want you guys to be looking for, scouting for, we're trying to eradicate it from the state, but as you see, it's quite, spread throughout the state. So it's gonna be a very difficult um, proposition. Those other times I told you we eradicated, it was a much smaller outbreak. It was in one area and much easier to control. So if you suspect you have it, here's my email, there's my phone number. Um, you probably all have my email from getting an email about this, this class. So you can just email me, send me pictures if you can. Um, I just want to mention bird damage because I get a lot of questions on this. It's very difficult to, 
to take care of or to stop bird damage. Some, some have bagged, some have used netting, um, but it's, it's difficult. So I just want to let you know that I think bagging is definitely out of the question with all the labor issues, but netting is something possible if you're really having a lot of bird issues. Um, I'm going to go through this real quick because we're about at the end here, but we did have a question earlier about where to plant. So you want to make sure your tree is getting full sun. I talked about pruning to get full sun. Sun gives the tree the energy to make the flowers and the fruit. So plant your tree somewhere where it's going to get full sun. Don't plant it too deep. If you plant it too deep, you're going to have issues. Uh, we talked about proper nutrition and water. So make sure you follow those, those steps. And this is a chart that you'll see at the back of the EDIS document on growing lychees. So it has, a, it has January through December and um, it tells you when to look for disease, when to look for insects, when to fertilize, when to use micronutrients, when to put out iron, even when to mow, when to use herbicide, when to irrigate, when to harvest, when to prune, when to look, when to do frost protection. So this is a good chart to have, and it's right there for you if you just search EDIS space UF space uh, lychee, and we have them on mango, we have them on many different, have them on avocado, we have them on uh, carambola, dragon fruit, so good information. Okay. So like I said, we're, we're right at the end here. So I just want to put out a plug for grafting tropical fruit March 2nd and tropical fruit CSI April 6th. And I'll look at the um, chat now to make sure we didn't miss any. Let's see, Dr. Green, Stewart. So the only other question was about small ants on the branches and the trunk. Is there a simple solution to get rid of them? Um, there is something, there is a, a sticky substance that you can put around the trunk of the tree so they can't get up the trunk. Um, so there, that's something that you can, you can do if you really don't want the ants on your tree. Okay, so thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, James has a question. Is everything you said about nitrogen and irrigation true in Central Florida as well? Yes, James, it is. So good question. So thank you guys. Thanks so much for coming and I'll see you for the next Tropical Fruit Tuesday. Appreciate it.